Break Hard Podcast here. We're doing a little different, bringing you video content this week. What we're going to do while there's no NASCAR racing on, or any racing for that matter, is go back and watch old events. So this week, we picked the 2007 Dodge Avenger 500 from Darlington, a classic Jeff Gordon win. But on top of that, it was the first COT race for, um, or over on the track over a mile. Dale Jr. had just announced that he was leaving DEI at the end of the year, so that was a hot topic during the broadcast. And the fact that it's from 2007, 13 years ago, was a completely different time in NASCAR. Like when I think back to 2000, <clears throat> excuse me, 2007 in real life, I think like that's really not that long ago at all. You know, sophomore year of high school, you know, playing football, whatever. But when I think back to like 2007 in NASCAR, it feels like an eternity ago. Dude, it feels so long ago. Just <clears throat> the fact that like Juan Montoya was teammates with David Strimmey in the 40 car. <laughs> David uh, Strimmey was the lead driver at CGR. <laughs> It makes no sense. Uh, Bobby Labonte was in the 43 at that point. Tony Raines was in the 96. Tony Raines, which is basically a Gibbs car. That's – Yeah. They made – they that was the first probably reference of that I've ever heard pre-2017 maybe. Right. They were like the the OG Furniture Row Racing essentially. Yeah. Gibbs only had three cars. They replaced – Bobby Labonte with J.J. Yaley, of all people. And like, I was just going to say that I didn't even mention that to you and when we were talking about it, was J.J. Yaley in the 18. He was in the top 10 there, I think, on the last – or around the top 10 on yeah. like one of the last restarts. My favorite part, because I watched the last, like, 60 laps uh, when I was eating dinner like an hour ago, but Daryl was like, yeah, oh, it's been a great run for J.J. Yaley today, and he's running 17th. I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. A great run. I know. I, I heard that too. I think that's why I'm getting confused with around the top 10. Cause that's really not around the top 10, but it, re- around is a relative term. Uh, you could be around it all day. Yeah. 20th. Uh, well, let's run through the field. Let's run through the field just so we can get that out of the way because otherwise I'm just going to shout it out randomly whenever, whenever like it comes to mind. Yeah. Go for it. So, I mean, let's, ju- let's just think, um, I don't even have the line up, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure right if this now. little cool. Uh, so I don't even know if there was, was the one car around? Was that, it's true X was in the one. Yeah. And then the O one one was Mark Martin. Yeah. The O one one was Mark Martin, the U S army for DEI. Uh, DEI, of course, hot topic in this race, which, which we will we'll gladly get to, but, um, okay, so Kurt Busch, obviously the no, yeah. And the two, obviously no three, uh, the four was either not there or, didn't warrant talking about it. I'm not going to run through the whole field, but Kyle Busch in the five. I mean, that's a big yeah. one. <laughs> Casey Mears in the 25. Sterling Marlin in the 14 for Bobby Ginn. When Strong Bobby Ginn, run. Yeah. Bobby Ginn stormed into the sport, and then he stormed out as quickly as he yeah. came in. Uh, Jamie Mack in the 26 car. Yep. Roush running know. five cars. Yeah. Good ones at that. Um, Biffle, Jeff Green. Biffle's up front. Jeff Green in uh, the 66 yeah. Best Buy car. That was – the most random sponsorship I've ever seen is was that Carl Long's team back then too? No, no, it was Gene Haas's team. Oh, okay, that's right. I, well, I saw yeah. that they had the seventy. I didn't realize they were teammates. What a mm. power! Kenny uh, Wallace in the seventy-eight, the Furniture Row start and park. Although they didn't start and park, they qualified good. They started, I want to say sixth. They did. <laughs> Furniture Row had a thing for Darlington uh, long before the JGR alliance. They definitely did. Um, David Gillen and Ricky Rudd for yep. Robert Yates. Paul Menard for DDI. Dale Jarrett didn't qualify for the race in the 44. Yeah. Uh, War Burton in the four didn't qualify either. Scott Riggs missed the show. Michael Waltrip and Jeremy Mayfield. Was this the Jeremy Mayfield? 40. No. No. He was in the 36, but was this the meth okay. race? What do you mean? When he got suspended. Oh. I think that happened pre two thousand seven. It couldn't have. Okay, they didn't. They didn't mention it once. They didn't. So uh, that's the only reason no, I say that. It was stuck out. Two thousand nine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Damn, I thought it was pre two thousand seven. Same. Um, uh, the all sport overall, car. Just uh, Kevin LePage in a front row car outqualified <laughs> everybody we just listed. Yep. It, Almondinger in the 84. He got a nice little shout-out towards the end. AJ did. He did. Unfortunately, finished 
36, but yeah. <laughs> He's like in position for the lucky dog. I mean, as a rookie, <laughs> hey. I'm just making a case. Uh, but yeah, it was one of the. I don't want to call it a strange race because it was wasn't that strange. But overall, a great start to finish race, oh especially God. when you, you look at like the number of leaders that we had between Gordon Johnson, well here Hamlin. Yeah, exactly. The top five all led over 20 laps. I believe it. Crazy. Yeah, Gordon, Hamlin, Johnson, Newman, Edwards, yeah. and Kenseth all led over 20 laps. Boyer led 16. Uh, wow, it was a really front-loaded field there for leaders. But overall, like – Yeah, Boyer did lead early. I forgot Boyer started yeah. on the pole, obviously. But, yeah, he did he lead early on. Yeah. Uh, did you notice – the next tell call of the race, who they gave it to? Uh, I don't think so. Ryan Newman in the number 12 all tell car. <laughs> <laughs> they would be called, don't give it to the. Yeah, our competition. Sponsor. Yeah, and they're. That's <laughs> hilarious. Larry Mack was like, I'm giving it to the 12. I was like, okay. That's hilarious. He probably may not got, pay, not got paid for that mention. But they. No, um, I also I noticed there was a, a pop up ad during the race for ATT Singular, which was. Mm-hmm. Their, you know, sprints, sprint next tells direct competition anyway. They got grandfathered in. Singular I, I assume as much. In. And then when at and bought them, they were given like a year or two years to in the sponsorship deal. I see. So that's how, well, Burton went to RCR with that, or not RCR. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, he went to <laughs> RCR with that sponsorship. Uh, or under the understanding that sponsorship would be there, and then it went away, and he had to run just a blank orange and black car for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I do remember that. All just very weird, but also, like, fair competition, more money is better for the sport, but... Oh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. We did... You gotta, you gotta figure, like, from the next tell side, they're like, we're paying this much money, we should get this perk. Yeah, exactly. The same way, like, uh, opposing gas companies can't sponsor cars. Yep. Because Sunoco has all of it now. Yeah. But because this was the race the week after Dale Jr. announced that he was leaving DEI, they talked so much Dale Jr. this entire time. So much. And now he backed it up with a really good run. I got to say that. Um, But, I mean, at every possible turn they talked about, they they played the segments – that were, I think, supposed to be pre-race segments, uh, pre-rain out or washout or whatever you want to call it. But they would play those kind of just during long green, green flag runs. And uh, they talked about – I mean, you mentioned Bobby Ginn. They they kept harping on Bobby Ginn and Ginn Racing, but they kept saying – they were talking about Dale Jr.'s options for next year, and they said Bobby Ginn's even expressed, you know, uh, interest – yeah, you think? Like <laughs> every team expressed interest. Right, he's the biggest name, arguably in the sports history. More people know about him than any other driver ever before. Imagine if he just signed with Bobby Ginn. <laughs> just like uh, RCR, Hendrick Gibbs. No thanks. This guy. Yeah. And then he would have signed with Ginn, which used to be MB2. Mm-hmm. Would have signed with <laughs> Ginn, and then would have merged back with DEI. Which yeah. would have been so stupid. But when you mentioned that they broke in like that interview in segments, the race got rained out from the day before. It's supposed to be a Saturday night race. Yeah. They had to have shown that interview during the rain delay coverage. You would think. Yeah, you would hope. Unless they were just kind of sitting on it, hoping that would be like a, a dr- more of a draw to the race, uh, right. which, you know, wouldn't be terrible. The awkward part was watching Daryl interview Dale. And he I know. Was like asking him about leaving, and Dale was like, you know, if Dad was here, we wouldn't be doing this. I like, <laughs> heard that too. <laughs> Man, that's heavy. That was toward the end of that race, and I think Dale was either leading or fighting for the lead or somewhere close to it. And, yeah, I was like, what a moment. <laughs> and then I, I – but I tried to, like, rewind my brain to – think like you know I was only six years after um it's just so interesting because it, it's so that Dale Earnhardt seniors discuss just so differently now 
you know, what are right. we, Almost 19 years, years removed? Years, yeah. yeah. So, but I had to like kind of harken back to that feeling. So there, anyways. Listening to them talk in the booth, where did you think he was going to end up based off of Ooh. what the booth thought? RCR, honestly. Yeah. Okay. And I, again, just tried to rewind, you know, my brain to think like, well, I would love to hear some of the sponsorship rumors. Like I, w- I wish if we watch another race from 2007, I'd love to hear it, you know, because when was it announced he was going to the 88? Probably. I know it was in the winter time. Yeah. I don't even know at this point, but yeah, definitely towards the end of the year, I would love to watch a race then just to see, because I'm sure that the sentiment had changed where they're like, he's not going to RCR. Right. Exactly. And like, I watched all these races. You had to pick up on so much different Yeah, stuff. like I just don't remember at this point because it was 13 years ago in the like, yeah. trivial thing. But yeah, I'm sure at the time I was probably like, I don't know. I don't know if I thought he was going to. This was peak J-Ski rumors though. Oh, so, this is like peak internet. Uh, Everyone has great internet access. Yeah. Discovering like, how to use it. Everybody had just had rumors. J Ski was uh, and like updates in the thread. I would I love to see those. My favorite J Ski thing we were on a family vacation, didn't have a laptop. I didn't in 2005 or maybe six. Yeah. Whenever it was announced that Gillen was going to Robert Yates the next year, the 38 car, I just remember sitting in a hotel lobby on like the communal computer. Just like going through J-Ski, just reading it at like six o'clock and then like sprinting up the stairs to tell my dad that Gillen was going because we were at that Kentucky race. Oh, really? Before. Yeah. So like, that's hilarious. We all kind of had like a soft spot for Gillen. We just wanted to yeah. his ride. And I like sprinted up to tell my dad and he was like, that's so sick. But that, was peak. that is so it. funny. Yeah, and then then he gets berated by Tony Stewart. Kid wins one bush race, uh, <laughs> like that. Win. The interview, it was, it was great team. Um, Wasn't that team based in Kentucky or something like that? Yeah, did they have like they had some kind of connection on the box and like <sighs> the eighty four? They the lose like five spots every time they came into the pits. <laughs> it was one of like, I know you've had these experiences too when you're at the racetrack where kind of everybody starts just rooting for one person. Yeah. Like on Indy 500 pole day and stuff, like when Carpenter gets it, the whole place is like, we want to see this happen. Right, except same... me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's just one of those cool moments, the underdog guys. Yeah. You specifically texted me this afternoon and said, to remember to talk about the Fox 3D. Oh my God. But you want to talk about a timely piece of history <laughs> being viewed on my projector screen behind me. Wait, you have a projector screen? Yeah, that's what the black uh, sheet oh, is. Oh, okay. It's literally a sheet hanging off a PVC pipe. Yeah, um, okay. Make do what you got to do. It gets the job done. So, uh, but you want to talk about a timely piece of history being shown and available to the public via YouTube. It is Fox 3D. So, let me, let me again harken back to how they use it. Okay, so... They use it in th- like the most random ways possible. <laughs> now, I thought this was a phenomenal broadcast, and, and I, yeah, that was another big talking point that I wanted to bring to the table was how great of a broadcast it was. But this Fox 3D thing couldn't have been more useless, and the fact that people thought that that was you know really good graphics. I mean, I, again, I thought back to that time period. Video game graphics were twice as good as that. Yeah, the Fox 3D graphic, and it's not like it was any kind of a simulation. Now, I'm sure there was some kind of a. a there's like some kind of a data point because mm-hmm. you know they could sit they simulate the car spinning and the way they spun but at the same time it was so worthless like they they showed it one time going back to a restart like two by two each car showing who it was in the simulation view mm-hmm. and it looked awful yeah. um and then they used it like i think one other time earlier in the race under green um that was again just worthless like they showed somebody being passed on there and it looked awful and then they also used it whenever I, th- I want to say it wasn't David Reagan. Someone spun later in the race and they used it to show the replay. Why is that? Was that ever going to be better than showing the actual replay? Maybe you got 10 billion camera angles to show whatever replay from. 
and instead they're showing a MS DOS, um, <laughs> you know, generated graphic. I don't even know if that's possible, but I'm just picturing the green and green and black screen. Yeah. <laughs> well, my favorite part of that, like you said, the graphics were awful. And they would always sell it as like, this is the future of how technology. Feel. Yeah. And the same thing with like, um, what is, what did they have last year? Like the NASCAR track vision or fan vision, whatever the hell they called that, that you could watch. On oh computer. yeah. Fan, fan vision. Yeah. yeah. So when you went to commercial, you could like watch where the cars were on track, but even that was terrible looking from everything that we saw. Right. And it's like looking at the introduction of the Fox 3d to what we have today it just hasn't progressed a ton but yeah the fox 3d they love showing that the car is like going over the bumps but they would like glitch and jump ahead real quick oh. looking back on it it's yeah so nice to see how much further technology has come yeah it was and if they only knew now if we could go back and tell our 2007 selves that uh we're we're getting hyped about live computer racing on tv then uh, oh, I wish I could flip the camera around. It's that BMW like i8, the one I sent you a picture of. I said it looks like a or it would look great as a GT3 car. Oh, they just drive past your. Window. Yeah, it just drove past. Yeah, I got the window open. Nice and sunny day here. It so nice. I had to close the window because the backlight behind it blacked out my face. Yeah, I just realized I need to turn this off. Uh, you actually look pretty good. No, we I'm... discuss this. Yeah, <laughs> lighting situation. So, but they – about the Fox broadcast, it was phenomenal. DW was in his prime of broadcasting, I think, and I'm being dead serious. Yeah, no, I agree. He sounded great. He looked great. He yeah. didn't have, like, a whole bunch of just nonsense to add to the broadcast. And it was also, like, what would that have been, year six of the three of them working together? Yeah. They really, like, had pretty much gelled at that point. And they all played off each other super well. Uh, it's just, it's disappointing to know that it used to be that good and how much yep. it sort of dropped off later in, uh, like, in 2015 up. Right. I, I wish I would have taken note of Mike Joy's statements going to break. Um, I, I, sh I shouldn't have introduced this point with that, but I feel like it was a lot more – you're right. It was a great broadcast. They were a great – They were their chemistry, the three of those, were great. I just feel like they had so many good personalities. You know, Chris Myers, super involved. Uh, Chris Devota on Pit Road. I'm trying to think of other uh, – Dick Bergeron, obviously, is a great reporter. Uh, Vin, um, I don't – I can't remember Vince Wells, but definitely Steve Burns was phenomenal. Um, and that was a nice uh, throwback to get some good Steve Burns. Uh, moments but just phenomenal anyways all did a great job and there were so many personalities but as it relates to the booth and just the overall broadcast and how it compares to today's i just felt like it was a ser uh, serious sporting event with a, a just the right amount of humor sprinkled in which is minimal you know right. um and very like inconspicuous in a way and oh, yeah, i feel no. like today there's just there's so many more like forced lines in there and forced um tones more so um than that broadcast and I, I tend to obviously like the one more like the past better yeah i feel like they try to be like midwest family friendly funny now yeah you're correct where, where like back in 2007 they still had that but i don't want to call it edgier it just felt more casual right yeah. It's like a network sitcom right now, and it used to be like a cable show, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Like no. a, a, a fun, but maybe drama cable show. Um, and now it's network, you know, sitcoms, like like you alluded to. Yeah, yeah the same, just plug and play. Yeah. And whether this works, so we're doing this. Since, yeah. Right. But what I was saying, that I wish I would have noted real quick, and then we can move mm -hmm. on. Sorry to interrupt you. Not but fault. one thing that I wish I would have taken note of was the Mike Joy, like, many statements or like taglines before they go to a break right so like some re or either that or when they cross the finish line so uh, i'll give you a couple modern examples i the ones that stick out to me i remember a couple of years ago uh true x1 at fontana and 
Mike Joy said, "True X goes California dreaming," and that just like sounded so. I don't know. Like <laughs> I know exactly it, it is that. like someone told him to say it, but it sounded like it was like trying to make a headline. Like leave that to the newspapers to do that, you know. So, but I wish I would have taken note just to how many of those type of things were said on this broadcast. But I just generally speaking, and from my gut feeling, I don't feel like there were as many. No, now I feel like I, we need to watch another Fox race from 2007 just to find out. <laughs> Yeah, just to see if what he says. Uh, one thing I didn't know, and I found interesting when they mentioned it in the broadcast, they said JJ Yaley ran the USAC race here Thursday night. You and I watch a lot of racing. We yeah. probably watch more like obscure racing than most people out there too. Yeah, I have never heard of the USAC Silver Crown cars running Darlington, but they did, and I think that's the most batshit crazy thing I've ever heard. I bet they are absolutely flying. Probably, uh, no, that's a long enough track. But like on, a, on a track like Salem or, or you know, a half mile, they'd be faster than a cup car around there easily. Oh, yeah. But, like, you've seen a Silver Crown car. I can't yeah. imagine driving that on a mile. It's, what is it? A basically 1.316, I think, is what the length there. That's a really yeah. fast racetrack. 900 horsepower, 1,200 pound race car. Yeah. There's no way. I, yeah, those those guys get a special level of respect, and and this is a uh, an example that I, I wanted to find a way to bring this up. I'll so I'll uh, I'll use this. Okay. So earlier today, I was on, or, wait, maybe it was yesterday. I was on Max Verstappen's Instagram or okay. James Davison. He, he did an Instagram live, and Max Verstappen was in the comments, <laughs> and uh, so the he had some other guy it was a dual instagram live and they were going through uh this guy's racing collection and he had the coolest stuff helmets fire suits everything short of the actual cars right but he had plenty of wings and from all types of racing nascar f1 rally gt dtm btcc i'm throwing out all the acronyms but <laughs> everything you could think of the most comment, the most comments, I think that was a really popular Instagram live. Like there's a like hundred people on there just because like people were like saying, Oh, Max is in the comments, you know, whatever. But it was basically a conversation between Max and then Davison and this other guy the whole time. Well, the most comments like in the comments were all about midgets. It was right. like, yeah, like, uh, you know, talking about how Davison did that, not talking about like die casts and things like that of, of midgets or open wheel cars, but just like a pavement, open wheel sprint car like that just garners so much respect because of just the the courage it takes i guess yeah well that's like last uh may when stewart went to uh i think it was tony stewart's somebody's sprint car shop and was yeah. like he got inside one and like was obsessed with taking pictures of it i think they have so much more respect for guys that race those than like yeah. your normal like european guys which is cool to see, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It was a it was a cool stream, but but back to Darlington and back to USAC at Darlington. Yeah. I didn't actually catch that they said that. But I, JJ Yaley's always been a grinder like that, so it does, I wouldn't put it past him. Yeah, I think he's a USAC Silver Crown champ. So I just texted my dad and I was like, "Hey, did you know USAC ran at Darlington?" And he texted me back and said, "Yeah, it's been a while though." <laughs> hey, thanks Jesus. for on the secret. Right. Um, yeah, that's still crazy. Another thing that the broadcast talked about a ton was the new car. They just oh kept referring God. to it as the new car. The new car is tough. The new car is this. <laughs> I hope to God if we get to <laughs> Gen 7 next year, we don't refer to it as the new car every single time it's on track. Dude. That was exhausting. The fact that they ran that car at a select number of races – Today, people would throw fits. I mean... Do you know the original plan for the COT? No, I don't. So, in 2007, it was only supposed to be ran at, like, tracks a mile and under, Darlington, and maybe one plate track, the Talladega Fall Race, I believe. And then okay. the next year, they were going to work it into those same tracks, the super speedways, the road courses and maybe a couple like mile and a half in 2008 and then in 2009 they were going to go to a full schedule so for two years they were going to run two separate race cars at different racetracks wow and then finally somebody smart said just run it all in 2008 and then right 
Jesus. That's ridiculous. I, I just can't imagine two years of just switching back and forth between <sighs> what essentially would have been the Gen 4 car and then the Gen 5 car. No wonder Hendrick had won all four races or whatever. I mean, I know it's early on in the process, but right. so what, what? So that was the original plan, and then NASCAR just essentially uh, re, rethought it? Or yeah, what? I think I read a quote last week where Dale Jr. was quoted as saying, I don't understand why we just don't do it all next year. And it's like, yeah, I get it. And the only concern people had was running it on a mile and a half because it hadn't actually raced on a mile and a half yet. That would have made for an amazing mile and a half race. <laughs> so they finally just in 2008 did it and it obviously worked out all right. But yeah. I just, the idea of just running two separate cars for two years, that had to be so expensive. That would, yeah. Good God. You're building man. two different race cars. You had I'm to I'm sitting have, here wondering if that didn't kick off like the economic decline. It definitely didn't help. Like running two race cars with the start of a recession, never yeah. great. Uh, but when the Gen 7 car does come, please, God, do not refer to it as the new car. <laughs> Every single yeah. time it touches the wall, gets into something, anything like that. Yeah, they don't talk about the new, I hate this term, but the new rules package currently near as much as they talked about the new car back then, which is yeah. nice. So that's that's kudos to the broadcast partners, you know, yeah, we complain about the nowadays. Package. Right. But luckily, they don't they it. don't sit there and talk about it. Yeah. Um, so I guess we have to touch on who won the race, which is <laughs> Jeff Gordon picked up his, I think it was a second COT win at that point, but did it with a car that was overheating for the last 70 laps, probably, <laughs> just spewing water right out of the ocean. Under caution and everything. Yeah. And, like, that last caution that comes out with, like, 13 laps to go, Steve Letarte like punches his seat because now his car has to slow down and it's not getting the same airflow through to try to cool it off. But they ripped all of the tape off yeah. the grill, which is unheard of. I did really like Larry Mack uh, brought up a lot of good points about the car, like especially if you listen to it throughout the race. He did. He's talking about where the radiator intake is on the new cars. He said it's angled down underneath. So if you remember on the COT car had an overhang in the nose right there, and then the radiator was underneath. He's like, that's a big pressure zone right there, and it just sucks all the rubber right up onto it. And I was like, we miss that kind of analysis now, essentially, which kind of sucks. But they did a really good job explaining it. That's exactly what happened to Gordon, and somehow he managed to keep that thing from blowing up. Yeah, it was impressive. Obviously, like ballsy calls by Steve Letard as well. Um, 28 years old at the time. It was just kind of cool to hear him as the young guy, you know, because he – how old was Gordon at the time? In, well, 2007. Uh, my guess would be like 35. Like, I was going to say like 35 or 36. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, perfect example. Like, I was thinking like, yeah, he was like almost 10 years younger. But I was also thinking, damn, he was my age. And like he kind of right. – Steve Letarte climbed the ladder kind of the old school way, I feel like. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's something that just really stuck out is just his story. So it's kind of cool that he's not only still involved, but I feel like he's, you know, promoting – I feel like he's as beneficial to the sport now and what he does now as he was. I mean, like, he's obviously talented being a crew chief, right. but as far as, like, pushing the sport forward, I feel like he's a great representation of the sport. It's crazy that you just mentioned that he's 28. I didn't, I don't know why I didn't realize that, but like when he's standing behind the pit box and he was like, yeah, man, if we come in and pit, we're going to be going out 25th. He's like, just run until it blows up. That's all we can do at this point. I was like, okay, you're just going to tell I know. Like Gordon, a four-time champ, like garners a certain level of respect just because yeah. he is. And now you're just like, hey man, run until it blows up. I don't know what else to tell you. Like, okay. Yeah. I'll say it. Jeff Gordon's four championships aren't a good enough representation of how good he was. Definitely not. Definitely should have had – probably should have had seven in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. 2000 – or not 2000. 1996 wins 10 races, finishes second in the standings. Um, and then you have the later years with the chase. If it would have yeah. been the normal points, like he wins one. But, yeah. I know. I, don't know what else to say about that, but yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, 
Hendrick was strong on May, you know, eleventh uh, or whatever it was, two thousand seven. Though that's for damn sure. I mean, even Casey Mears was running up front at the beginning. Yeah. Um, in the top ten, like pretty strong. I would say beginning and midway. Um, that was the JGR Chevys, which was weird, very weird. But it, if if there is another thing I learned, it's that Denny Hamlin being really good at Martins or <laughs> Martins, Darlington is nothing new. Like Jesus, he was dominant no. in that race. Also, like I think people forget too. Like Denny was in his what would that have been? His third full year. Yep. And the level of respect he showed, I don't know if you noticed that this either. I did. Like, there was one point when he passed Biffle and yep. he turned underneath. Yeah, and stuck the hand out. I noticed that too. Yep. And like, I thought that was really cool for a guy who was really young at that point. Yeah. And only in a second year to like acknowledge the fact that like, hey, thanks for, for giving me that spot. And, yeah. You know, not ruining my race right there. But yeah, Denny, a young Denny Hamlin. At yeah. That, it's crazy how much he is matured. He had such like a baby face. He had like a the baby fat, you know what I mean? Kind of like mm-hmm. baby face. But yeah, he has he really has, man. He's been yeah, he's been good there and just good in general for a long, long time. Very few people. I mean Jimmy Johnson, uh, Newman are the only no, I mean, I know there's more than that, but like Harvick. I'm just thinking of guys that were like fast on that day, Boyer, that are still fast now. Yeah, Kurt I don't know if you mentioned Kurt, but Kurt Yeah, Kurt Bush was fast. Yeah. Still fighting for wins. Um, it is crazy no, that. Like, no Keselowski. Yeah. No, it was down. Yeah, it was down the nationwide series at that point. Yeah. Just trying to make a, a living. My dad found the uh, a clip of USAC at Darlington. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'll I'll forward it to you after we get done here. But please do. Yeah. So I think for next week, we'll probably review an old F1 race. Um, yeah. We'll tweet it out beforehand. I just had one pop up on my TV screen. I'll tell you about in a second. I haven't watched it yet. Okay. But um, yeah. So we'll do this as long as the I like this happening, and I like uh, this. Go from there. But you can follow Zach on Twitter at Zach Miles Two. His Twitch stream also Zach Sh- Miles Two. Shit stream tonight. <laughs> you can follow myself at Apex Off, ApexOff.com, and then um, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and we'll do more of these. As long as we're all stuck in our homes, essentially. Yeah, going to be fun. Looking forward to it. Definitely.